Chapter 1. You would have to be a dog to know what a dog is thinking. For many years, researchers have been using MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, scans in their laboratories to understand the mechanism of the human reward system. MRI uses powerful radio waves and magnetic fields to produce detailed images of the tissues and organs in the body. Although Dr. Gregory Burns grew up with dogs, he only got one when he completed medical school. He had been married for five years to Cat, and the kids weren't in their plans yet. After surviving the gruesome 100-hour weeks, they got a pug, Newton. Though they got some other dogs, Newton was still the king of their hearts. The kids, Helen and Maddie, came along and bonded with the dogs. At 15, Newton's health deteriorated, and it was time for him to go. He was laid to rest, but his spirit never left Gregory Burns. One question kept lingering on Dr. Gregory Burns' mind. Did Newton ever love him back? He was curious to know what his dogs were really thinking. A few months after Newton's death, Cat Burns and the kids went back to the animal shelter to adopt another dog, Calypso, a.k.a. Callie. Dogs and humans belong together. We couldn't exist without each other, Dr. Gregory Burns. Many authors have attempted to answer the questions about a dog's mind, but most answers are based on two flawed assumptions. The human tendency to anthropomorphize. We tend to project our personal feelings and thoughts on other things. They are relying on wolf behavior to interpret dog behavior. This is known as lupomorphism. Wolves and dogs do have a common ancestor, but dogs did not descend from wolves. So what can we do to know a dog's mind better? If we knew that dogs could reciprocate feelings in dog-human relationships, everything would change. It would mean that dog-human relationships are just like human-human relationships. In human interactions, mentalization is a critical skill. This is the ability to understand the mental state of another person. Read on to find out the whole truth about the relationships between Dr. Gregory Burns and his dogs. Do they love him as much as he loves them? Also, these chapters contain information that can potentially strengthen the bond between you and your dog. Chapter 2 Callie's state of alertness never waned, even when lying in bed trying to sleep. Callie was nothing like Newton. First, she was chosen because of her muscular and lean body, which differs from pugs like Newton. Her head was similar to a periscope because she was constantly on the lookout for prey. Despite her friendliness, most dogs in the neighborhood avoided her because of her posture. At an early age, it is pretty easy to note the differences in the behavior of dogs based on their breed and nurture. To make matters worse, Callie usually killed chipmunks, and she also avoided body contact with anyone in the home. When it was time for bed, she would readily sit at the foot of the bed and watch out for potential intruders. Dr. Gregory Burns couldn't stop thinking about the significant difference between Callie and his other dogs, especially Newton. Before long, Callie got signed up for an introductory obedience class at the dog training facility Comprehensive Pet Therapy, CPT. A long time ago, a Russian physiologist known as Ivan Pavlov did a study on a dog's digestive system and his findings, which seemed negative to him, led to the discovery of classical conditioning. For instance, the presence of food usually makes hungry dogs salivate. Still, Ivan Pavlov discovered that a neutral stimulus, e.g. a ringing bell before the food appears, can make the dogs salivate. Though classical conditioning is powerful, it cannot be used to train a dog. Instead, operant training, i.e. instrumental learning, teaches the animals to carry out purposeful behavior. For instance, a hand signal is used to tell a dog to sit, and when the dog does, he is rewarded. Going into an MRI is not a natural dog behavior, but Dr. Gregory Burns and the dog trainer, Mark, had to teach Callie a natural sequence of reactions. For example, down-stay, a position in which the dog lies down and stays put. 
For the dog project to succeed despite the MRI noise, Dr. Gregory Burns had to use some criteria to select the ideal dogs for the study. The dog had to be social, relaxed with strangers, free of noise phobia, and full of motivational drive. Callie didn't meet all these criteria, so the search was on. Chapter 3. The challenge with MRI is that sedatives are used to keep the test animal perfectly still. The MRI scanner is loud and might make a person feel claustrophobic. Talk more of a dog with supersensitive hearing. On the other hand, sedation was not an option because it changes most of the brain's functions once administered. The dogs had to be wide awake to capture and study their brain image for the dog project. The sense of hearing of dogs is four times as sensitive as that of humans. In the early stage of the project, everyone in the lab was focused on the big question, i.e., finding out about the events in a dog's brain. They were so captivated that they didn't make adequate arrangements for the practical aspects like the type and location of a brain scanner. It is expensive and hard to book several hours on an MRI scanner, which is a limited, high-end clinical instrument. Soon enough, Dr. Gerns and his team found Yerkes National Primate Research Center, which had a facility for MRI scanning. The center director, Leonard Howell, invited them to look at the scanning of monkeys' brains. Training boxes housed a sterile interior and a cubby for wires and tubes for monitoring equipment. Each monkey is held down by a collar on its neck and fits into a restraining device used during an examination. Then the monkey's head is usually immobilized in a soft cast. To make the operations run smoothly, the behavior of the monkey was shaped via rewards. Leonard Howell's research group had a focus, the biology of drug addiction. The monkeys were used as test subjects because it was unethical to use humans for such projects. Dr. Gregory Burns and his team had seen enough to know that the center was not appropriate for the dog project. The center was not enthusiastic about the project either. Chapter 4. The road to scientific progress in biomedical science is littered with the bodies of many animals and humans. Nazis were the first to start experimenting on humans. As a result, harmful examinations were done on the people held in concentration camps with a silly justification of progress in science. Due to those horrific experiments, a code of conduct was established on the proper process for doing medical research. So, for brain imaging experiments, a panel usually reviews all the procedures. The Nuremberg Code of 1947, based on ethical principles in experimentation, was the result of indiscriminate experiments on humans and animals. But how will things differ with the dog project? Though there are principles for human research, the law does not classify animals with the same rights as humans. Animals are just seen as property, and researchers can choose to do as they like. Of course, we don't see animals this way. In 1966, the Animal Welfare Act was signed into law. According to the Act, any entity that carries out experiments on animals, i.e. universities, needs to have a committee that reviews and approves research protocols. Universities are seen as research facilities, and they need to abide by federal rules and regulations to continue receiving grants from the federal government. To kickstart the dog project, Dr. Gregory Burns and his team prepared a protocol document and sent it to the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, IACUC. They encountered several hurdles before approval for the project was confirmed, but eventually they received the news they were waiting for. The lawyers signed off on the dog project. Chapter 5. A clicker is critical to the reward system that shapes dogs' behavior. Callie was the first test subject, and Mark had to train her. When Callie did as instructed, he used a clicker, an audible tool to measure an exact time. He then instantly rewarded Callie to enable her to establish the relationship between a click and a reward transfer. A dozen clicks later, Callie understood the concept. Clicker training is used to tell dogs that they are doing something right. 
Since it's hard to replicate the same click manually all the time, the clicker is usually used. A new subject soon joined Callie. Melissa Kate participated in agility classes with her dog, Mackenzie. She decided to volunteer in the dog project when Mark told her about it. With treats in hand, Melissa quickly coaxed Mackenzie to lie down in the head coil. This is a tool to help support the dog as they are undergoing MRI scans to assess brain activity and behavior. Even when Melissa backed away, Mackenzie didn't move from the position. Then a surprising event happened. While Mackenzie was lying still in the head coil, Callie watched her slowly and became still. This showed that dogs learn from each other by mimicking each other's behavior. Imitation, also known as social learning, is an apparent human behavior, but strangely, dogs haven't received much credit for practicing. For some weeks, Callie went through more training with the head coil. The goal was to stay consistent with short daily training. The tasks were then made complex with the addition of elements before the final behavior. Steps, chin rest, and mock noise were added to the head coil to entirely shape complex behaviors in the dogs. Chapter 6. How Will Dogs React to a Machine That Uses Circulation Pumps and a Compressor? With the rapid process and training, Callie and McKenzie were almost ready for the MRI. Their first encounter with the living machine had to be good and pleasant. If not, the weeks of training and conditioning would go to waste. The first problem was noise. Such loud noises are known to cause hearing loss in dogs, but earmuffs can minimize that risk. The dogs had to get used to the entire experience in the scanner environment. This reduced the risk of them panicking and running wild. MRI makes loud noises that can get as high as 100 decibels, the same decibels as a jackhammer. The second problem was ghosting, i.e. unreliable MRI results due to movement. Meanwhile, dogs tend to place their heads in different positions in the head coil. A slight movement of the dog's head during an MRI scan causes ghosting and can mess up the results. The solution was to find something to hold the dog's head in place, like the chin rest at the back and sides. One day, an idea came to Dr. Gregory Burns to use a broken boogie board as a sort of 3D cradle that provided secure support, i.e. up, down, front, and back. Callie didn't mind it one bit as the cradle was fitted on her neck. The new chin rest was the new solution for the motion problem. Science is about questioning how the universe works and discovering new things, not memorizing a series of facts out of a textbook. Science constantly changes as we learn more about the world we live in. Dr. Gregory Burns. Chapter 7. Due to some missing or distorted landmarks, a dog's brain looks nothing like a human's brain. All the training and preparations led up to the D-Day, the dog day. To get started, the dogs were allowed to run around the lab to burn off nervous energy, since a little tiredness helps them to stay still in the MRI. To study the human brain, the scan is usually done in blocks of 10 minutes. This time dropped to five minutes for dogs since they can't stay engaged for that long. With earmuffs over her head, Callie scooted into the head coil and was ready to go. Everything was fine until the scanner's shimming noise freaked out Callie. She ran out, but she got back into the MRI after some tries. Before long, images of Callie's brain and spinal cord showed up on the scanner console, and everyone was ecstatic in the lab. Even though they had to adjust the location settings, 60 functional scans were eventually captured, surpassing the goal of 10 valuable images. The run was also done on McKenzie, and the dog day was over. Differences between dogs and human brains leads to uncertainty in neuroscience research. From the experiments that they just did, they were able to control visual channels with hand signals and taste and smell with peas and hot dogs given to the dogs. With three more trips to the MRI, the first phases of the dog project were completed. A small experiment was also done to understand dogs' mental world better, showing that the smell of a familiar human activates the inferior temple lobe. 
Dogs do remember the important people in their lives, even when those people aren't present. Did you know? The most prominent part of a dog's brain is the olfactory lobe, which makes the dog's sense of smell 100 times more sensitive than that of a human. Conclusion Throughout the world, dogs and cats are the two most popular pets that descend from predatory species. So when the dog project began, it was all about scanning a dog's brain to understand their feelings for humans better. Was the dog-human relationship one-sided? There is an old metaphysical debate on the question of what a dog is thinking. As humans, our whole experience happens mainly inside our heads. It's through the activity of our brains that we see a rainbow or shooting star. Similar events occur in a dog's brain, but they react differently. When a dog barks on seeing food, we think the dog wants food. That same dog might bark in front of a TV, but we can only wonder if that means the TV is too loud or fun for the dog. To understand what goes on in the canine mind, Dr. Gregory Burns and his co-workers established The Dog Project, a research program to study the thoughts and emotions of dogs with functional MRI. The Dog Project was ultimately successful. Dr. Gregory Burns and his team found direct evidence of reciprocation in the dog-human relationship and social cognition in the canine brain for the first time. This is why dogs are comforting when we feel down and can obey our commands over time. In answer to the question, what are dogs thinking? The significant conclusion is that they are thinking about what we are thinking. They appreciate our company and also consider themselves to be human's best friend. Try this. If you have a dog that can't sit still or follow your instructions, Use a clicker that gives instantaneous feedback and a reward system to train your dog. Spend time with your dog so that they can create a mental image of you. Avoid wearing a lot of perfumes to allow your dog to learn your natural scent.